In a recent update on Russian military operations in Ukraine, I mentioned these uh, high-speed anti-radiation missiles the United States has apparently been sending Ukraine. And I wanted to go more in detail into this because I now am continuously hearing about how this, this missile, finally, this is going to clear a path through Russian air defenses and allow Ukraine's air force or what's left of it, to wreak havoc behind Russian lines. And I, I want to reconnect people with reality who are thinking along these lines. And I want to do it by showing you sources from the Western media explaining just exactly what these harm ordinance are that the U.S. has sent Ukraine. Now, Evidence that these missiles were being sent to Ukraine surfaced before the Pentagon admitted they were sending them. So there were a couple of uh, uh, missiles that had been shot down or obviously didn't hit their target. Uh, Russia was reporting that these missiles were being used by Ukraine in the conflict. There's a couple of articles um, from Drive, uh, The Drive, Ukrainian MiG-29s are firing AGM-88 anti-radiation missiles. There's also this one. Uh, new evidence of AGM-88 anti-radiation missile use by Ukraine emerges. And then how Ukraine could have quickly put AGM-88 anti-radiation missiles to use. And this was not done quickly. This took months and months to do. And it was most likely done as Alexander Makuris from the Duran pointed out in a recent video of his, this was likely done before the conflict even began in late February. This is something that the U.S. has been working on for a while. You cannot just integrate a U.S. missile into a Soviet era warplane. It cannot be done. And I'm going to get into the details of what exactly this missile is, how it has been used uh, since it was developed in the, and deployed in the 1980s. Uh, and I, I will show you what the problems are with the story that the West is putting out about how this is another wonder weapon or, or how this was just thrown together at the last minute uh, to help Ukraine. So I, I want to start out by uh, showing you exactly what the Western media has been saying about this missile. So here is from Business Insider. The U.S. has been quietly giving Ukraine radar hunting missiles. That could really be a problem for Russia. So here we are hyping another wonder weapon that the U.S. is sending Ukraine. But uh, what I did notice in this article, and I will get into that here in just a moment, they, they are tempering it. They are adding uh, disclaimers buried deep in the article, but it's there nonetheless. This is what the article says. It's open season on Russian radar stations as Ukraine deploys U.S.-made anti-radiation missiles designed to home in on radar beams. Ukraine's advantage is likely to be temporary as the Russian military adapts. So maybe I was wrong. They kind of threw cold water on it in the second sentence. Uh, but for now, the presence of the AGM-88 harm or high-speed anti-radiation missiles will make Russian troops think twice before powering up their radars. No, it will not. Uh, the presence of AGM-88 spelled trouble for the Russian air defense radars needed to defend against Ukrainian helicopters and jets and for the counter-battery radars used to locate Ukrainian artillery, including U.S.-made multiple rocket launchers. And I would say uh, Russian radar operators are, should probably be more worried about being struck by lightning than being hit by one of these missiles. And again, it'll all become obvious in just a moment. Uh, so first of all, Russia has huge numbers of radars in their air defense system and in use as counter-battery radar. They have a huge number of radars, more radars than Ukraine has warplanes available to it, and more radars than missiles that will be sent to Ukraine to hit these radars. Even if everything was ideal, under the most ideal conditions, these are not missiles that you fire at a radar and it's, it's always a hit. It is not like that. And I'm going to talk about the sort of missions that these missiles are used in, and you will see how complicated, difficult, and dangerous it is, even for the best trained US pilots who have available to them, uh, for argument's sake, almost infinite resources during each mission. That is not the case for Ukrainian pilots. They give a little short history about the AGM-88. The, the Business Insider says, Harm 
is a powerful weapon, but not a new one. It was first deployed in 1983, and the 14-foot, 800-pound missile has a range of 30 miles and a top speed of Mach 2. U.S. aircraft conducting suppression of enemy air defense missions have used the AGM-88 in several operations, including in Libya, Iraq, and Yugoslavia. The missile is now used by 15 countries in total. The AGM-88 is a descendant of the AGM-45 Shriek, which was used in the Vietnam War with mixed success. And there's your first hint that this type of mission is extremely difficult and dangerous, even under the, the best possible conditions. And then buried deeper down in the article, here comes the disclaimer here. Here comes uh, another bucket of cold water. Anti-radiation missiles are not wonder weapons, but they can be highly useful. When launched prior to an airstrike, they can suppress air defenses and clear a safe path for friendly aircraft. They can also be fooled by tricks such as decoy radar transmitters. For example, the US TLQ-32 decoy system places fake transmitters at a distance from the real radar. And of course, in addition to Russia having the most advanced air defense systems on Earth, they have a very long history of dealing with these type of missiles. They were the ones giving air defense systems to Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and they're the ones who came up with the countermeasures and adapted to US, the US use of these anti-radiation missiles, or the, the predecessor to the AGM-88. It also says in Ukraine, anti-radiation missiles will likely have a limited impact. Well, I think even that is an understatement. Air power has so far not been a decisive factor in the conflict. Ukraine doesn't have enough modern planes. Exactly. And Russian pilots have been surprisingly cautious and ineffective. Shutting down Russian air defense radars won't necessarily translate into more success for Ukrainian aircraft. Not, not even close. Like I said, they hardly have any aircraft at all. And they'll fly two or three sorties a day with the aircraft that they have versus Russia, who flies 200 to 300 sorties a day. And that is, those are numbers according to the Pentagon, not the Kremlin. It says, for now, the deadliest weapon in the Ukraine war is artillery, and harms will help Ukrainian forces hit the Russian counter-battery radars that track shells and rockets in flight, calculate their trajectories, and pinpoint the howitzers and rocket launchers that fired them. Uh, and I, I just don't think so. I don't think that that is going to happen uh, for all of the reasons the Business Insider themselves pointed out. Are there any stories of success? Have you heard anything in the Western media about these AGM-88 harm, uh, these missiles, having any sorts of success on the battlefield? Well, I just showed you those Drive articles. The evidence that Ukraine is using these missiles uh, come in the form of destroyed missiles laying in a field and one jammed into a house. Uh, the one stuck in the house has evidence that it was shot down by Russian air defenses. So this is a missile meant to uh, punch a hole through Russian air defenses or at least frighten them into turning their radars off. And instead it was shot down by Russian air defenses. The other missile, again, in a field, what we have not seen so far is a harm uh, AGM-88 missile buried in the middle of a Russian radar set. Now, again, Alexander Mikuris of the Duran, he pointed out how in order to transfer these missiles over to Ukraine, in order to adapt Soviet warplanes, uh, to be able to fire these missiles would take months, months to do. This conflict has been going on for six, seven months. Uh, this was likely in the process of being done before before the conflict even began, most likely. It takes a long time to integrate these missiles with a Soviet-era aircraft. It also takes a long time to train pilots on how to effectively use it. Even in the US Air Force, when a, a new ordinance is introduced, a pilot has to learn a new ordinance. That, that, those could be classes that go from, from weeks to months and then they have to train they have to practice in the air ukraine does not have the ability to do that now in order to carry out these suppression of enemy air defense seed missions sead seed missions that is what they're officially called in order to carry these out you usually have specialized 
uh, aircraft that are built specifically to do this or modified specifically to do this. You also have pilots who are specifically trained for this type of mission. Uh, and it takes, it takes months to do both of these things. And Ukraine doesn't have either one of these. So they would have had to have started from scratch. They're going to fire a US missile from a Soviet era warplane, and they're going to need to find a pool of pilots to begin training on how to carry out these missions. Now, let's take a look at this article right here from the Aviationist. Now, let's scroll down here. The risky business of being a wild weasel pilot. So a wild weasel pilot, these are pilots who carry out sea missions, suppressing enemy air defenses. And this is what the article says. Today, the typical Air Force wild weasel platform as the aircraft used in the seed role are best known, is the Block 50 F-16, which has replaced the F-4G Phantom. To perform this kind of mission, the Block 50 Viper mounts the HARM targeting system, HTS pod, which is the main tool used by the wild weasels to find SAM surface to air missiles. Once placed on the right side of the engine intake, today the HTS is mounted on the left side, while on the right side there is the sniper targeting pod. In this way, while the HTS provides every kind of information about the enemy radar to the AGM-88, high speed anti-radiation missile harm, the sniper gives the Wild Weasel F-16 the ability to deliver a smart bomb on the SAM side. So forget about that. That, is, that has not been given to Ukraine, not that we know of. And that again, that would be an additional system that they would have to train uh, in order to use effectively. This very same article talks about U.S. airstrikes on Serbia in the 1990s. And I, these were also using the AGM-88 missile. And they were attacking SA-3 and 2K-12 Cub air defense systems. Now, R Russia uses significantly more advanced air defense systems. These are, these are outdated. You're, you're not going to find Russia using these systems on the battlefield. As a matter of fact, the United States has, has never faced modern Russian air defense systems on a battlefield. The closest they came at the time, the systems that Vietnam had were advanced, and the United States struggled tremendously to deal with them. Uh, they have not, in recent years, faced modern Russian air defense systems, the S-300, the S-400, for example. Uh, let's read a little more uh, from this article, what, uh, what this type of mission entailed. Noteworthy, the Air Force F-16s had the chance to demonstrate their effectiveness in the seed role during Operation Allied Force over Serbia. A large NATO strike package was heading to Serbia, uh, an area to perform nighttime bombing runs, and my four ship arrived early to find and suppress any air defenses. Just before the first package arrived, my flight came under attack by an SA-3 and large caliber AAA. This is uh, anti-aircraft artillery, guns, guns firing rounds into the air to hit aircraft. I directed my number three to engage, but he was unable to respond due to his own defensive maneuvers. So I turned my aircraft approximately 150 degrees in the opposite direction and fired a harm at the SA-3 site. As I pushed the pickle button, I became the target of the SA-3 and 57 millimeter AAA. After evading these threats, Blink was able to rejoin his flight and move to another location to cover the second NATO strike package. As the attack aircraft were targeted by SAMs and AAA, Blink directed his wingmen to shoot their harms dispense flares for man pads, these are man portable air defense systems, and reminding the entire four ship to watch out for AAA and for the high terrain in the area. His second and last harm shot appeared to shut down the SA-3 and quiet the area. After the second NATO strike package completed its mission, Blinkensop reformed his flight and returned to base. So uh, these were old, anti-air systems being used by Serbia. Uh, these are well-trained, uh, well-trained, experienced U.S. Air Force pilots flying these missions. Uh, they have huge amounts of resources behind each and every mission that they fly. 
And yet Serbia still managed to shoot down a few uh, NATO aircraft, including uh, the F-16 of uh, U.S. pilot Scott O'Grady might, might have remembered that story. We're talking about entire groups of aircraft flying in, o over Serbia specifically for this mission to suppress enemy air defenses, in addition to the aircraft carrying out bombing and, and escort. So this, this is what the U.S. had to work with, and despite going up against antiquated air defense systems, they still lost a few aircraft. Ukraine doesn't have any of these advantages. They have none of these advantages. And if the U.S. was having difficulty doing this in Vietnam or over Serbia uh, to, a, to a much lesser extent over Iraq, then Ukraine is most certainly going to have a much harder time of it. Because not only do they lack any of these advantages, they're also going up against much more advanced air defense systems than anything the U.S. has ever had to face. As a matter of fact, you'd almost think, uh, because of just how futile uh, the, the notion is of Ukraine using these missiles to take out Russian air defenses, or to even make a dent on their counter-battery radar systems, or to even m make them s even slightly worried about these missiles. Uh, the prospect is so low for that, you'd almost think that the United States is just using this opportunity uh, to try to find some sort of vulnerability in Russian air defenses that they could use for future reference. And they're going to use Ukrainian lives and aircraft to do it. Because nothing that these aircraft are going to do with the, these missiles that the U.S. is sending them is going to make any difference on the battlefield. And I hear a lot of people say, Brian, you keep saying it's not going to make a difference, but it's certainly prolonging the war. It is prolonging the war. There's no doubt about that. It's definitely prolonging the war, but it's not making any difference in terms of how the war is going. The war is going in a way that will see Russia win and Ukraine lose. And so, no, it is not changing anything for the conflict. Prolonging the conflict is not changing the conflict. It's just stretching it out longer. There's a, a major difference. Now, a lot of the hype that we hear about all U.S. weapons and U.S. military prowess overall, it, a lot of it comes from when the U.S. went into Iraq uh, back in the early 90s and also 2003, the, the invasion of Iraq in 2003. What people don't know, because the Western media hyped up the Iraqi army, they they were saying, you know, uh, you know, it's the biggest, it's the fourth biggest army in the world. They've they've got all of these aircraft and all of these missiles. Uh, true on paper, that was true. But if you actually looked at the condition these weapons were in, what type of weapons they were, uh, they were antiquated. They were falling apart. The troops operating them were poorly trained, and so the U.S was not going up against a uh, peer or near peer military. It was going uh, up against an extremely inferior military. And we know how inferior Iraqi air defenses were because there have been a lot of studies about them since. I want to show you this paper, Assessment of Iraq's Air Defense System in the Iraq in the Iraqi Freedom Operation. Uh, this was published in 2019 by the Department of National Security and Logistics at the uh, Polish Air Force University. Uh, why is Poland interested in Iraqi air defenses? Would, would they would tell you in just a moment. But this is what the paper says in conclusion. There are no doubts that the Iraqi air defense system in the first and second war in the Persian Gulf uh, had to face the most modern air weapon systems that had been invented so far. An additional difficulty in its functioning was that it had to act alone without the support of an ally. The outcome of the first and second clash of the Iraqi air defense with the state-of-the-art air technology of the United States and other coalition countries proved to be catastrophic. It confirmed at the same time that the Iraqi system was largely an arsenal of outdated means of reconnaissance, command, and combat, which only seemed dangerous and threatening. Only seemed, but wasn't. When assessing the course of the result, results of the second Gulf War, it can be concluded that many other more technologically and organizationally advanced air defense systems would have survived. However, in all probability, with a better command organization, the Iraqi air defense could have been more efficient. So 
even though it was antiquated, if it was just better organized and the troops better trained to operate it, it would have been much more dangerous. But because it wasn't, the United States had a, a relatively easy time uh, overrunning these air defenses. And yet, Iraqi air defenses still managed to take down a few U.S. warplanes and coalition warplanes. Now, I told you the paper was going to explain why they were looking into this. It says, from the Polish perspective, this is important because especially the armament of the Iraqi anti-aircraft system was, in many respects, analogous to the one we currently have in the Polish armed forces. Analyzing the weakness of Iraqi air defense, we have the opportunity to learn about our own shortcomings. So, uh, and I've mentioned this many times before, uh, Russia and China have superb air defense systems. The West has always been behind in that regard. And Poland is very far behind in that regard, and they admit it, and they're, and they're looking into ways they can address that. The United States has never gone up against uh, the most sophisticated air defense systems Russia has. We, you could even see in Syria, you have Russian forces and Russian air defense systems. In Syria, you have US and also Israeli warplanes operating in that area they operate around russian air defense systems they have they have no interest in going up against them uh, because they know that it would be catastrophic for them they, they know how capable these systems are i have gone over in the past western analysts funded by the u.s government who admit russian air defenses are among the best in the world i just showed you how complicated and how dangerous uh, suppression of enemy air defense missions are. Uh, even when the U.S. has all of the advantages, it is still an incredibly dangerous mission, and it's a very difficult mission to carry out. I also explained to you the disadvantages that Ukraine has in, in regards to carrying out these missions versus the U.S., and how and not only do they have all of these disadvantages that the U.S. didn't when going up against uh, adversaries with air defenses, the U.S. went up against enemies with uh, inferior air defenses. Ukraine is going up against superior air defenses. And so these AGM-88 missiles, the U.S. said to Ukraine, have, have no chance at all in changing anything at all on the battlefield. It really does look like they're just using this as an opportunity and using Ukrainian blood and aircraft in the process to just see what, hey, what would happen if an AGM-88 went up against the, the, the Russian air defense network? What would happen? Let's find out and let's use Ukrainian lives in the process and their aircraft that they have a very small number of. I want to impress upon people how cynical all of this so-called aid is going to Ukraine. It is not actually to help Ukraine do anything. It's to uh, prolong this conflict for as long as possible. Uh, bleed Russia as much as possible, no matter how hopeless it is in the end that uh, Ukraine may somehow prevail. They're not going to. And every day that goes by, they lose more territory and they lose more lives that they will never be able to get back. They will not get that territory back. They will not be getting these these lives of these young people and now old people dying uh, uh, on the battlefield. It's just... This is the true face of U.S. aid to Ukraine. And Ukraine has a very small number of aircraft that, you know, whichever side you're on, just, just being objective, they have certain roles that these aircraft could be contributing to something on the battlefield. The U.S. is giving the, them these missiles that are hit or miss even under the best conditions. They're giving them these missiles to fly these incredibly dangerous missions that increase the likelihood that these aircrafts will be shot down. So I, I hope that gives you a little bit of context when the Pentagon says they're sending these harm, these high speed anti-radiation missiles and you're gonna cut a path through Russian air defenses. They're gonna do no such thing. They're actually endangering the lives of these pilots and the aircraft by, by putting them on these always dangerous and difficult missions, even under the best conditions, and Ukraine is doing them under the worst possible conditions, and doing so up against the best air defenses in the world. Just something to think, uh, just another thing to think about when trying to sort out this conflict 
and sort out the information you see coming out of the Western media. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. Uh, check the video description below, especially if you're watching this on YouTube, for other places you can find and follow my work. I'm on Telegram. I update that several times a day. It's a good alternative for Twitter and Facebook. I am also on Odyssey and Rumble. All of my videos from YouTube are automatically uploaded to both of these platforms. In the video description below, there will be quite a few references, everything that I went over. And there's a couple of articles from Air Force Magazine talking about the suppression of enemy air defense missions in the, the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, and also in Vietnam. And you can read for yourself how dangerous and difficult these missions were, again, for the United States under relatively ideal conditions. And then just imagine how much more difficult it will be for these Ukrainian pilots. Just keep all of that in mind. Also in the video description below, because I do not monetize my, my videos on YouTube, not in any way, so if a commercial pops up, feel free to skip it because it's not doing me any good. If you want to support my work in the video description below, there are links to buy me a coffee, Patreon, and also PayPal. Everyone who has been helping out, whether it's month to month, one-time donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, just helping get the word out there to more people, uh, that helps out a lot. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you for watching.